Hello, and welcome to First Chapter Friday, where every Friday I read the first chapter of a book that you just might want to finish yourself. My name is Kathy. I'm a youth librarian at the City of Palo Alto Public Library, and today we're going to read a special book. Before I get to that, though, I want to remind everybody that March, which is what it is now, is Women's History Month. And during that month, we like to recognize the achievements and accomplishments of women everywhere. And I think it's important to remember it's not just necessarily the famous ones that you know about, but all women, because they've all contributed to where we are today. So, today's book is called Ahimsa. It was written by Supriya Kalkar, and it's historical fiction. So it's not fact but it is based on some facts from the author's family. And I think you'll really enjoy it. So let's read from the inside cover. In 1942, after Mahatma Gandhi asks Indians to give one family member to the freedom movement, 10-year-old Anjali is devastated to think of her father risking his life for the freedom struggle. But it turns out he isn't the one going. Anjali's mother is. And with this change comes many more adjustments designed to improve their country and use ahimsa, non-violent resistance, to stand up to the British government. First, the family must trade in their fine foreign-made clothes for homespun cotton. So Anjali has to give up her prettiest belongings. Then her mother decides to reach out to the Dalit community, the untouchables of society. Anjali is forced to get over her past prejudices as her family becomes increasingly involved in the movement. When Anjali's mother is jailed, Anjali must step out of her comfort zone to take over her mother's work, ensuring that her little part of the independence movement is completed. Inspired by her great-grandmother's experience working with Gandhi, New Visions Award winner Supriya Keller shines a light on the Indian freedom movement. So... Chapter 1. They wouldn't hang a 10-year-old girl, thought Anjali, clenching a small tin of black paint. She took care not to get any on the skirt of her saffron gobrook choli, woven with real gold thread. It was Anjali's Diwali present from last year, made from the most expensive fabric in the shop. She had picked it out herself, and she had managed to keep it as bright and crisp as the day she had gotten it despite heavy monsoon rains that had drenched her little town in the middle of India. Hurry up, whispered her friend Irfan, as he glanced nervously around them. Perspiration beaded around his collar near the black thread of his tawiz, the necklace whose locket contained Koran verses. Clad in a cool white pajama kurta, he was more appropriately dressed for the muggy August weather than Anjali, but he couldn't stop sweating. We can't get caught. Getting caught vandalizing someone's property would lead to quite the punishment under normal circumstances, but Anjali was about to do far worse. She was about to vandalize a British officer's property. A British officer who was in charge of making sure the British Raj's orders were carried out in their town. A British officer who happened to be the former boss of Anjali's mother. Only a week earlier, Anjali had stopped by the captain's office after school to catch a glimpse of her mother through the window, as she'd often done for the past year since her mother became one of Captain Brent's secretaries. Anjali normally found her mother translating decrees and legal notices for Captain Brent, typing letter after letter on his behalf to their fellow townspeople, rejecting requests from families begging for mercy for their imprisoned freedom fighter sons. That day had looked like any other. She had found her mother hunched over the corner room desk, typing away as Captain Brent lounged on his scarlet silk sofa under a faded oil painting of Queen Victoria. He was dictating to Anjali's mother in his harsh foreign accent, and Anjali couldn't help but stare. The next day, her mother was out of a job. Anjali still didn't know what had happened, only that her mother and father had fought, and that her great uncle, Chachichi, who lived with the family, had never approved of her mother's job in the first place. Anjali's mother had just become one of Captain Brent's secretaries when Chachaji moved in with them after a close call in one of the Hindu-Muslim communal riots that swept the city of Bombay in 1941. 
Chachiji was old and old-fashioned and couldn't get past the fact that a woman was working outside the house. But Anjali's father didn't mind that Ma worked. The extra money came in handy for feeding the extra mouth. And Anjali's mother was college educated, so why shouldn't she put her proficiency in typing and her fluency in English and five native Indian languages to use? Anjali's mother hadn't mentioned Captain Brack all week, except to say she was relieved she didn't have to see him anymore. But there was something Ma wasn't saying. Had Captain Brett not paid her? Or had he hurt her? And Jolly only knew one way to handle the situation, to hurt the captain back. So when Irfan got a half-empty container of paint from his father's newly painted dairy and asked Anjali what they should paint, she knew just how she'd do it. She and Irfan would paint Q, short for Quit India, on the bungalow he worked out of. Maybe then Captain Brett and the other British officers would finally leave India for good. Over the past few weeks, it seemed like all the British officers' houses and workplaces but Captain Brent's had been vandalized with a queue. He was definitely one of the more intimidating British officers, ordering everyone around, regardless of their caste, acting like all Indians were untouchable. But what right did he have when he had no caste? What Anjali was about to do was terribly wrong and terribly dangerous, but she raised her paintbrush to the crum crumbling concrete anyway. Just do it before he sees us, hissed Irfan, playing anxiously with his curls. I am, Anjali told him, irritated. And relax, everyone is still eating breakfast. The streets are empty. No one can see us. Irfan motioned behind them. Across the street, a small girl coated in camel-colored dust was crouching on the footpath near the empty pond stall, collecting a stray newspaper page that the Panwala used to wrap his betel leaf treats in. The girl's eyes met Anjali's, but Anjali didn't bother hiding the paintbrush. She's an untouchable, Irfan. She isn't going to say anything. Untouchables were the lowest of the low in the ancient Hindu caste system and were stuck doing the dirty jobs others in society wouldn't do, like cobbler work, leather work, clearing dead animals from the road, removing raw sewage from people's toilets, and cleaning garbage from the streets. And because they had no choice but to do these dirty jobs, everyone considered them dirty. Superstition said if you touched them, you would be cursed with bad luck or be unclean yourself, tainted by them. And though her parents had never really mentioned their thoughts on the caste system, and Jolly had heard such cautionary tales all her life from Chachiji, her neighbors, and her classmates. Knowing there was no way this untouchable girl would speak out of place and tell on her, and Jolly turned back to the job at hand. She wasn't afraid of the girl, or Captain Brent. She was a member of the Brahmin caste, after all, highborn. And Jolly's slim gold bangles jingled melodiously in the morning light as she raised her brush once again and finally painted a circle into the chalky pillar, staining it a decaying black. There, now you finish it she whispered, handing the paintbrush over to Irfan. For spying heavily, even though he was in the cool shade of the tamarind tree behind them, Irfan took the paintbrush and clumsily swatted it across the bottom of the circle. Okay, now let's get out of here. Quit, India, squealed Anjali, much louder than she had intended, then ducking back behind the pillar. What was that? Who said that? Bellowed a towering white man in his gravelly British accent. And Jolly and Irfan peered around the pillar, keeping hidden, and watched as the man stormed out of the bungalow. Brent Sahib, Irfan was frozen in panic. Run, shouted Anjali, dropping the small paint tin. Grabbing Irfan by the arm, she raced through the streets, leaving behind the black key on the outer wall of the bungalow's compound, but not before glancing back at the heavy set English officer seething at the defacement, his sunburned face turning even redder than usual. The two friends sped around the bend, Captain Brent hot on their tail. They dodged a peacock and narrowly missed the streets Panwala, a wrinkly old man who was on his way to open his shop for business. They swerved past a white horse on the side of the road, decorated with pink feathers and a gold and pink saddle, ignoring the angry shouts of its owner. They ducked around barking street dogs whose fur was thickly matted with dust. And Jolly paused for a split second to pet a spotted puppy on the head and then rounded another corner down an alley that looked very different from the lane the bungalow stood on just a street away. 
What are you doing? huffed Irfan, trying to keep up. Shh! And Jolly squeezed around the bend. Irfan hesitantly followed her into a basti, a small cluster of a dozen tiny clay shacks with tin roofs. It was the untouchables basti. The two of them plugged their noses so as not to get a whiff of the hardened dow cow dung cakes that were drying on the outer walls of the shacks to later be lit for fuel and entered the maze of lanes. It was hot and sticky in the narrow passageways, and they had to twist their bodies so as not to brush against the grime that was coating the impoverished dwellings. And Jolly checked her gagra. It was still unstained. Now look what you've gotten us into, Irfan gasped. We're stuck in some poor dunghole. Putrid odors of rotting fish and open sewage floated around them as Anjali surveyed the scene. Captain Brett was nowhere in sight. At least Brent Sahib didn't catch us. She breathed a sigh of relief, forgetting that the subsequent inhalation would bring with it the stench of the underprivileged area. She gagged and hurled as he made her way out of the hiding spot. Rafan right behind her as they ducked under some damp clothes hanging on a clothesline and came to the small clearing in front of the homes. A few untouchable children were starting a game of Gili Danda near the exit to the main road, and Jolly recognized the tallest one. It was Mohan, her family's toilet cleaner. Though he was 13, he didn't go to school. He couldn't. He just wasn't done in their town. Besides, even if he had lived near a missionary school that accepted every Indian student regardless of case, he still wouldn't have gone to school. After all, he had to make a living. It was his job to remove the waste from their bungalow's outhouse every day. Mohan and his friends stopped hitting the ghillie, the small cylindrical stick with the danda, the larger stick, to stare at Anjali and Irfan in wonder. Anjali returned the stare, taking in the kids' sunburned, crusty faces and their matted hair, no longer black but reddish-brown. When she was younger, Anjali had been envious of the Basti kids' unique hair color. Her own hair was a boring, deep black, and it was so thick she kept it tied in two waist-long braids soaked in coconut oil. Then her father explained that the poor children's hair had turned reddish brown from a lack of proper nutrition. And Jolly never complained about her hair after that. She glanced at the untouchables children's dirty, tattered clothes, barely covering their scrawny frames. Her exquisite Jacques Choli, with its hand embroidered floral border, must have looked unattainable to the kids. The wobbling ghillie rolled towards Anjali's feet. Don't touch it! Don't touch it or your chachachi will beat me, shouted Mohan. Please! He'll say we cursed you! And Jolly jumped back from the ghillie. A slight wrinkle found on her forehead, stretching her round red bindi into an oblong shape as the children raced for their ghillie, careful not to go near Anjali or Irfan. Yes, it would have been a bad day if she and Irfan had been caught by Captain Brent. Going for an untouchable every day was a bad day, Anjali thought as she turned away from them. Let's go home, she mumbled to her fawn. I don't think so, muttered a voice from behind. And Jolly froze. It was Captain Brent. He led Anjali and her fawn by the elbows back down the street toward his pristine bungalow. Two servants were already busy bringing a can of white paint and brushes to the pillar, preparing to wipe out any evidence of Anjali's crime. Let us go! And Jolly was trying to pry Captain Brent's pudgy fingers off her when she noticed a coin-sized smudge on her right arm, a blot of black paint. Her stomach sank. She tried to scratch the paint off, but only a few shreds peeled away as Captain Brent led her up the stairs of his house, where her mother stood waiting, arms crossed. What are you doing here? And Jolly blurted, shocked, but also relieved to see her mother. Even in frustration, Ma was radiant. A necklace of black and gold beads with a gold pendant dangled from her neck. Her flower-shaped diamond earrings sparkled. The stray strands of silver in her mother's otherwise midnight black hair looked regal. She was wearing her peacock-colored sari, one of Anjali's favorites. I was coming back from meeting some friends in town. What are you doing out so early? And in your best chakra goli, Anjali's mother asked. Painting the cue on my compound wall, replied Captain Brent, before Anjali could respond, roughly releasing Irfan and her from his grip. I must say, Mrs. Josie, I am quite disappointed in you. If this is what your daughter is like, you're raising a common criminal. Flustered, Anjali's mother turned to her. 
Did you do it, Anjali? Anjali glanced at Irfan. He was on the verge of tears. She had to get them out of this mess, so she steadied her voice and shook her head. Of course not, Mom. You little liar, thundered Captain Brent. I knew you were a bad seed. You must be the most disobedient child in this whole bloody town, perhaps in the entire British Empire. And Jolly wanted to giggle at Captain Brent's exaggeration. Imagine her being the most disobedient child in their little town of Navrangpur, much less the entire British Empire, which had controlled most of India for the last 80 years. But Anjali's mother was not smiling. This must be a misunderstanding, she started, when a lady entered the compound. Wearing a simple cotton sari, deep lines of stress carved under her gray eyes, she approached Captain Brent with hands joined in a namaste. Here again, Captain Brent sighed. As we tell you every day, Mrs. Mishra, we can't help you. But, Sahib, I will not write a letter of pardon for him, Captain Brent said loudly. Your son burned down a municipal office. Please, Sahib, the woman's eyes glistened with tears. Nobody died. He was overzealous in his love for India. He's just 17. Look, I brought you his picture. See, he's just a boy. She held up a tattered black and white image of her son, a tall teenager with a little mustache and big, light-colored eyes. Please, they've set a date. They say he'll hang in the spring. Rules are rules, Mrs. Mishra, said Captain Brett as he led the woman off his porch. Now, off you go. I'm dealing with something important here, so have a good day, but please don't come back tomorrow. And Jolly watched her mother avoid eye contact with Mrs. Mishra. Did they know each other? Captain Brent shook his head at the sight of the woman's tears trickling down her cheeks under her son's photograph. He turned his attention back to Anjali. Now, where was I? Right, this uncivilized vandal you have raised. Anjali's mother stood firm. Please, Captain Brent, is a splotch of paint on your wall more important than someone's life? Wait, is he actually considering hanging me? Anjali squeezed her mother's hand. Ma? How many times to go, uh, do we have to go over this? That boy is a criminal. He broke the law, Captain Brent said. And Jolly breathed a sigh of relief. They were talking about Mrs. Misha's son, not her. There are law rules in this land, thanks to us, Captain Brent continued. Those who disobey have to face the consequences. In this case, the consequence is his hanging. That isn't my fault, Mrs. Joshi. That chap should have thought before setting fire to the property of the Raj. Captain Brent turned back to Anjali. You know something about destroying property, too, don't you, little girl? And Jolly held on even tighter to her mother. Ma stared Captain Brent square in the eyes. There are a hundred little girls in this town who could be mistaken for her. If my daughter says she didn't do it, she didn't do it. Before Captain Brent could say anything, she took Irfan by the hand and led Anjali and Irfan off his property running with the kids down the street, away from Captain Brent's bungalow. And Jolly was in complete shock. Her mother had defended her, defended her lie. Once they were a good distance from the captain's bungalow, they slowed down and Irfan headed home. And Jolly gave her mother a grateful hug, clutching Ma's waist. She could feel her mother's pulse as it raced from the morning's events and wondered which of their hearts was beating faster. It's okay, Anjali, whispered Anjali's mother. There's nothing to be frightened of. Anjali nodded, tucking a strand of hair behind her ear. Catching Ma's eyes, Anjali stopped abruptly, thinking of the smudge of black paint. While Mrs. Misha was talking to Captain Brent, Anjali had tried to rub it off some more. Had Ma noticed it? Anjali quickly moved her arm behind her mother's back, squeezing her even tighter than before. And that's the end of chapter one. I do hope you'll finish it. You'll learn a lot about the Indian movement for independence from Great Britain, as well as about ahimsa, or the practice of nonviolence, and what everyday people, especially the women, did to help that. You'll also enjoy the story, I think, of Anjali and the things that she does and learns throughout the book. So thank you for joining me for First Chapter Friday, and I hope you'll do so again another time. Goodbye.